All right, we'll go ahead and get started here in the interest of time. Uh, thank you all for making the time to uh, attend our last virtual field tour of 2020. It's certainly been a wild year. And uh, today's uh, virtual field tour um, is going to be a little bit different than the ones that we've had uh, the past eight in that it's going to be more interactive. And our three student research assistants this year, Maricos Rhodes, Cassandra Waterman, and Brad Remsey co-produced this field tour. So it's uh, intended to present a little overview of the crops we grew this year in our dry farm trials, uh, and also um, give us a chance to connect a little bit more. So there will be breakout rooms and the questions that they um, wanted to have us focus on in these breakout rooms were sent in the email that you got before, but no worries if you don't have that in front of you because uh, Cassandra is going to give us the questions once we go into breakout rooms. So uh, for the first part of the field tour, um, it might be best since there will be video shared for you to keep your cameras off. But um, once we get to the Q&A, if you want to turn your camera on, um, it might it'd be nice to see your face if you're comfortable with that. And um, can you go to the next slide, Maricos? So we had um, harvest boxes this year and featuring some of the crops we grew. And so uh, 15 people signed up for harvest boxes and 50% of the proceeds from um, the sales of these boxes will be going to seed costs for next year's uh, variety trials with the Dry Farming Collaborative. And then another, the other 50% is gonna go to wildfire evacuee relief so uh, we really thank you for your support uh, in that way. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Maricos. All right. Um, my name is Maricos Rhodes. I'll just introduce myself um, quickly and describe my experience with the dry farming collaborative work this year. Um, I've been working on farms for about five years um, in the Willamette Valley and also up in central Washington, which is uh, a place that's heavily reliant on irrigation. And um, I've realized up there it wouldn't be possible to do farming. But um, my experience here and there uh, sort of made me come to believe that water limitations and scarcities is more of a bottleneck for food production even than land area. And so if we want to grow more food and if we want to have more access to land and have more farmers be able to enter production and enter the market, then um, being able to grow food without irrigation, I think is a, a really important thing for us to figure out um, as humans. Um, so that was kind of a motive for my interest in the dry farming cooperative to begin with. And uh, I'm a master's student here at Oregon State uh, writing about organic and sustainable agriculture. Um, and I first found out about the DFC at a potato variety trial last fall. I tasted lots of delicious potatoes. Um, and this year has been a major learning experience um, for me. On the left, that photo is uh, my dog hanging out in some popcorn that we grew out that we were hand pollinating uh, at Lewis Brown Research Farm. And um, he was getting some, some shade in the corn jungle there. Um, so it was really awesome to learn about hand pollination of corn. And in the middle, um, that photo is uh, some potatoes that we planted at a solar power site. Um, and it was, it was interesting there to learn about the kind of dependence on weather and soil factors uh, for dry farming. You know, it, it gives you, you have less kind of flexibility with timing when you're dry farming than you do with irrigation because you're more dependent on sky water. Um, and it was interesting to learn about the benefits, uh, for corn that dry farming offer, um, with some varieties that we've worked with, uh, the yield doesn't drop that much when you dry farm it versus irrigated corn, but there's less, generally less risk of lodging, corn falling over, uh, there's less 
like mold issues and obviously less weed pressure um, later in the growing season. And I learned all about uh, the process of, you know, agricultural science research and how kind of messy that can be and how a lot of it is predicated on uh, human, you know, human action in the field. So I learned that, you know, it's always imperfect and a little bit messy, but still really valuable. Um, and in the future, I think that an ideal farm system could be, or ideal dry farming system um, would really want wind breaks. It was uh, really impressive to me how important of a, of a factor wind was in uh, dry farm production. So it just got me thinking that wind breaks could potentially represent one uh, way of adapting to climate change and potential water scarcity uh, with agriculture. And I want to grow more corn. I just really came to love the, uh, the corn plant. So that's me and that was my experience with uh, dry farming this year. Now we have Brad. Hi there. Uh I'm Brad and I am currently an undergrad at Oregon State studying crop and soil science with a focus on soil. Um, my background is I grew up in Ohio, so obviously irrigation is not much of a problem in a land of large rains. <laughs> um, so coming to Oregon, it was uh, quite the experience to, to uh, see with the seasons, like having the dry season and then in extremely wet winters. And that's where most of the moisture for the area comes from. Um, so I got involved with agriculture uh, once I moved out here. And I had never had the opportunity to work with dry farming. Everywhere I uh, had experienced was both used irrigation. It was market gardening. Um, I also got into beekeeping. So during that time, I had done a lot of reading and was curious about dry farming uh, after reading about the Hopi tribe. Uh, in the Southwest and how they were able to grow in very low um, uh, rainfall. Um, but obviously no farms are really willing to take that risk uh, and mostly for financial uh, reasons. So uh, once I came across the uh, Dry Farming Collaborative, I was like, this would be a great opportunity to step in and see what the potential is for these kind of systems. And but with my background in soil, I was working a lot with Matthew Davis on our dry soil, or I mean on the uh, soil management trial, which there's an image for one of our, our leafy treatment in the bottom left of the slide. Um, uh, so before I, like before getting into dry farming, I thought it was a viable option. I was just wanting to get into it. Um, and now I think there's a lot of potential in it. Uh, some of the things that blew, surprised me were how well a lot of our tomato plants did. I did not expect us to have such an abundance. Uh, I thought they were going to be small and very small harvest, but that was not the case this season. Um, some other, another highlight was getting to meet Andy Gallagher and having him do a soil profile at the soil management treatment. And he, this, the day he was visiting with us was uh, photographed in the top right. Um, I also have uh, images from the potato planting and then also right after we had mounted at the solar site and I fell in love with the electric G tractor. We were using that to uh, weed between all the corn rows. So it was, <laughs> it was a lot of fun to get to play with that and see, be able to work and not have like a blaring engine behind you. Um, and then reflections for the future. I, I think I would love to do it. Um, more dry farming. I think the biggest thing when doing uh, evaluating sites for it, though, is definitely what's going on in the soil and dermat between the texture and uh, the stability of it to maintain the plants and continue allowing them to thrive. So, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Cassandra Waterman. I'm also an undergrad student. I'm studying ag, agricultural sciences um, and pursuing an agricultural education uh, degree after my undergrad. Um, I was really fortunate to get to work on the tomato variety trial this summer. Um, my prior experience with dry farming was 
non-existent. I didn't really know much about it until I joined this wild and awesome group. Um, it was really interesting to me because the, I think that the dry farming project addresses one of the most pressing issues in agriculture, which is limited access to water for irrigation um, as a result of climate change. And this year has just shown that we need to take a more systems-based approach uh, to food, productive, food production um, to create more resiliency within our food system and farming community. Um, things that I learned, uh, to, to draw on what Mariko said, I, you know, I realized how labor intensive research production is compared to market production. You know, there's the element of consistency in data collection and then data analysis. And sometimes that means lots of counting and reweighing. Um, so it was really neat to get that experience in the field. And then we, so we grew over 200 varieties of tomatoes to evaluate for blossom end rot. And this year turned out to be a really good year to look for that because we had a wet spring that led to early luxurious foliage growth and then we had drought. So um, yeah, that's kind of the recipe for blossom end rot. Um, future things and things that surprised me was uh, the success that we saw across tomato types. I think that we all were kind of expecting that of the 200 varieties, we'd have a, a small handful of successful tomato varieties. Um, but we were surprised and we, we had successes in, in every single category. So we'll get to talk a little bit more about that when we showcase the varieties. Um, and then I just wanted to give a disclaimer, I guess, that the varieties that we're showcasing are based on observational and preliminary data. So we'll know way more after we complete data analysis and then we'll report back to you hopefully this winter. So uh, if you signed up uh, to receive a harvest box, this is, or if you didn't, this is what is inside them. So we'll have Amy give us a little tour. Here we are at Oak Creek Urban Horticulture Center. We're packing boxes for our dry farm virtual field day. We're here with Amy Garrett, and she's going to show you what's in your harvest box. All right, we have a Belmonda uh, potatoes, which were one of our highest yielding varieties this year. Uh, uh, about 45 pounds per 10 plants on average, but yeah, lots of a lot less um, pest pressure. It seems like on this one compared to some of the other varieties this year. Dirty Girl, which is one of my favorites to can. Um, and very little blossom and rot on these beauties. Uh, I made sauce with these this year, it's really good. Uh, this is Malacara, uh, Malacara, which we got from um, a cooperative in Spain, a um, woman named Esther. So uh, it's a storage tomato, and I actually have some of these hanging that uh, in storage in the pantry this year that we're gonna see how they store. They're supposed to store for like eight months. And this is a Sikriman, which is a potato we grew uh, last year. And we decided to continue because we, um, we like this one. Um, Belmond is one that we dry farm this year for the first time. So uh, Sikriman is a really nice potato, goes nice in stew. Um, for Delicata, in the past we've just grown a Zeppelin Delicata, but um, this year we tried it alongside Candy Stick. Uh, dessert Delicata from Fertile Valley Seeds, Carol Duffy, and also Honey Boat. So you can see there's like uh, the Delicata are more uh, yellow, and you kind of got more butternut colors in the candy stick and then the Honey Boat. And um, maybe we can cut one of these open in a bit, and you can kind of see, I think that some of these have more flesh, and some of them are more hollow for stuffing. And then the last thing here we have on the table is uh, Whipple uh, beans, which 
have been a standout variety in our dry bean trials for the past few years. So that's what we got here. Oh, and um, I, did, I forgot the BHN. Uh, what's the name of this one, Matt? BHN 871. BHN 871. This is, this is from a grafted plant. Grafted. It's grafted. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful yellow. I haven't tried these one, uh, this one yet, but Cassandra said that they're really good. Very sweet. All right. We have uh, next the we'll discuss our different varieties and crops that we grew starting with uh open oak party mix uh and corn lucas niebert can describe that process what we did this year in the background i'll just be playing this video here it starts with walking through the dry non-irrigated section and then moves into the irrigated section of uh, the trial hi there uh I'm Lucas Niebert and this corn breeding project was uh, my own, uh, I was the project lead on this and Maricos helped considerably in, in addition to Brad and Cassandra and we're basically, our goal is to breed a dry farm uh, corn variety, field corn variety for the Willamette Valley, Pacific Northwest. And so we're, we're selecting for earlier finishing, higher yields, and drought tolerance. And this variety open up party mix uh, has been available by uh, adaptive seeds near Brownsville, Oregon. And they purposely just added a lot of genetics to it. It includes uh, dent corn varieties from the Midwest in a nutritional breeding program out of Wisconsin, in addition to some New England Flint varieties that pushes the, the corn a little earlier and adds a little more flavor. And so we've been starting with this large uh, pool of genetic diversity. This It's a very good opportunity to select um, for beneficial genetics in dry farming systems. And so this year we, we planted out uh, 200 different breeding lines where last year we had created those breeding lines just by uh, um, doing hand pollinated crosses. And yeah, we're evaluating them and we'll, we'll pick the top 40. And then next year we're going to open pollinate those together for a new improved uh, drought tolerant variety. So in addition to the open oak uh, breeding program, we also did variety trials for Novik, uh, Northern Organic Variety Improvement Co Coalition, is that right? Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. Improvement Collaborative, excuse me. So um, we tested many different types of corn, um, from dent corn to flint corn to sweet corn, um, all trying to evaluate them for uh, masa potential. So we were looking, we're going to look at flavor, um, texture, and then that texture will determine how well it works with like masa making machines, for instance, with that, those that are run by uh, Three Sisters Nixtamal, um, which is a company out of Portland. And um, so we are also evaluating for dry farm performance, which includes yield and earliness and uh, anthesis silk interval, which is the interval between when the male flowers start shedding pollen and then the female flowers uh, put out sh silks, which um, obviously you want those two events to kind of coincide and the further apart they are, the less likely pollination is and the more drought stress that indicates. Um, and so 
we had a big variety uh, or a big range of earliness versus lateness um, on my slide. When I introduced myself, you might remember I was I showed a a blue corn, um, and that was Papa's blue, which is kind of like a, it comes up to you know your thigh, and we were pollinating it in July, so that one finished really early. It was the first one that we harvested, kind of a dwarf variety, and then there was another variety called Silver King, which um, we were pollinating like two weeks ago, I think. And those plants grew about 15 feet high at uh, Lewis Brown Research Farm. It was just, I mean, the biomass was incredibly impressive, but um, they're probably not early enough to be reliable producers here in the Pacific Northwest or in the Willamette Valley, at least maybe in Southern Oregon, it would work. Um, so it was interesting to work with those different varieties and uh, the hand pollination process is, uh, is amazing thing to learn about as well with uh, Jenny Kling, who is a really interesting uh, researcher and corn breeder. And Lucas, do you want to add things about this trial? Uh, no, I think you did a, a great job. I Yeah, uh, just Keith, there's, we're going to answer questions at the end, but real quick, we planted the these corn varieties uh, relatively late in, uh, yeah, last week of May, early, like first week of June. So um, that reflects, yeah, that's gonna reflect, some of them aren't gonna be able to finish in time. But uh, yeah, we tried to select some corn uh, d varieties uh, representing each color of red, yellow, white, blue. There's even a Oaxacan green variety. So uh, for those of you that tuned in to our tomato variety trial uh, field tour that was earlier this season, th some of these will be familiar to you. Um, but these were some of the standout varieties across types that we saw. <clears throat> dwarf Champion 15, Azoichka, the Dwarf Champion, that's, that's part of the Dwarf series. Um, we found that dwarf plants did really quite well. They were more compact. So they were, it was amazing to see these large heirloom type fruit on these smaller plants, um, but they wouldn't need to be staked. They were pretty impressive. Um, and then large slicers, large heirlooms like the Azoichka and the Jersey Breeze, you know, these are things that uh, consumers look for at market and I think producers really enjoy growing. Um, we saw very little blossom end rot on some of these varieties. Uh, Dirty Girl did incredibly well. They, we actually, this picture is after, after all of the rain and all of the smoke and all of the ash, um, the tomatoes still looked perfect and they had just still really incredible concentrated flavor that you would expect from a dry farmed tomato. Um, the Dro rootstock, Matt, you can, um, you can probably speak a little more to that, but the tomatoes that we grafted onto the Dro rootstock um, had very little blossom end rot and were extremely productive. That BHN 871 that you saw um, in the Harvest Box video, that was grafted onto a Dro 141 TX rootstock. And then the smaller varieties, um, we saw very little to no blossom end rot. So I would say that if you were considering getting into, you know, dipping your toe into uh, dry farming tomatoes, that would be a really great place to start. Matt, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just a, a note on the um, DRO 141 tax rootstock. Um, it was one of, um, I believe, five different rootstocks that we trialed. Um, if you're interested in grafting your own tomatoes, it seems, uh, you know, based on our preliminary um, viewing that it did the, the best out of all the rootstocks we trialed. And you can purchase the seeds um, from Johnny's Seeds. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay, I can talk a little bit about this one, Cassandra. And if you have anything to add, um, you can feel free to uh, jump in. 
Um, so uh, Cassandra and Alex and uh, the, the tomato variety trial, um, I didn't have a huge part in, but I did get some extra plants uh, from them and planted a border row at our Oak Creek site, which is actually in my uh, background image here. <laughs> so we planted a border row of storage tomatoes. And the picture here is I, I, I was able to harvest these uh, before the fire and the rain <laughs> that happened uh, recently. So I, I have them hanging in a room uh, at, that you see pictured there. And a lot of these are supposed to store, uh, I've read in some of the descriptions, you know, up to eight months. So my plan with these uh, storage tomatoes that I got from the variety trial is to just evaluate monthly throughout the winter and see how they taste and store. I know that we got to taste some of these in the field, um, was walking through with a couple people and tasted them and um, in uh, late August, they were really acidic. Like we uh, didn't have a water bottle with us and we were like, oh my gosh, my throat is burning. Need to find water right now. So they were pretty acidic in the field, but I imagine the sugars develop as they ripen. And um, I think there's a delayed ripening gene involved in storage tomatoes. I don't know much about that, but um, I'll be reporting back on what we find from this trial. We have a a winter grower meeting with the Dry Farming Collaborative every winter. It's usually in January or February. So um, if you're able to attend, we'll be sending out emails about that and I'll share what we learned. My turn again. Um, so this, uh, we got to grow um, uh, Delicata squash this year. So just highlighting some varieties on this slide, uh, Curcurbita pipos. So uh, that have stood out in either this year or previous trials. So uh, Dr. Alex Stone and Jenny Wetzel uh, had small wonder, which is that spaghetti squash pictured uh, right there to the right, the little yellow round squash. And that was an extremely high yielder uh, dry farmed. We did not include that in our trials this year. Um, I know some people love spaghetti squash and some people don't care for it much, but um, it was definitely a standout variety for in their trials. Um, this year we did grow um, delicata. So I can talk a little bit more about that because I was a part of the um, evaluation and harvest for these varieties. Uh, so honey boat we got from Siskiyou Seeds, which is in Southern Oregon. And down there on the bottom right, you can see two pictures of honey boat. Um, and on the very bottom left picture, you can see it's like a twin honey boat. And so there is a interesting thing I observed when harvesting these that there were quite a few twin honey boats. Uh, I didn't see that in the other varieties, but there um, was a notable amount um, of uh, the twin honey boat. So if that's of interest to you, you might try honey boat uh, for the twin um, delicata phenomena. And um, Zeppelin Delicata is the one, uh, the more yellow squash pictured in the middle. We got that from Wild Garden Seed. And um, by the way, these last two varieties, Zeppelin and Candy Stick, are both pledged with the Open Seed Source Initiative. Um, so you can't, um, uh, you know, uh, patent these varieties or um, there's no, uh, they're pledged with the Open Seed Source Initiative. And, um, it's a really interesting project. If you would like to learn more, they have a, have a great website and even a podcast where they feature stories about plant breeders and the story of different uh, varieties. So um, Zeppelin Delicata is a squash that I've included in the dry farm trials in previous years, and um, it has done fairly well. Uh, that They tend to yield lower than the maximums, but um, still good quality. And you can see the picture just um, to the right of the heaping tote of squash. And um, the, that is from our site in Albany, Oregon. And so that was one plot of Delicata. And none of the other varieties were heaping over like that in one harvest tote. So uh, I haven't um, uh, tabulated all the data and started to um, an analyze it at all, but uh, just in, uh, that was a picture from the field, just noting that there's um, a lot coming off those Zeppelin Delicata plots. And then uh, the other variety um, there on the bottom um, right is Candy Stick. 
I'd actually, I think these are kind of out of order. The bottom right is Zeppelin. The one in the middle there is, um, is uh, Candy Stick. And that one is, um, we got from Adaptive. At, I think it's actually a variety from Carol Deppy, uh, Fertile Valley Seeds, but we bought our seed from Adaptive, who were also stewarding that variety. So um, I haven't got all our data together, but I'll again share that at the winter meeting. Lucas, you want to take this one? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, sort of took the lead on the Cucurpa de Maxima trials. We, we trialed um, this year, we trialed uh, Silver Bell, Stella Blue, and Tetsu Kabuto. Um, so the, the blue ones in this picture with the, with the orange flesh. Um, North Georgia Candy Roaster has generally been a really high yielder when we dry farm it. Um, it's a little, as a giant big banana, it's a little harder to sell at market, um, but it is definitely a winner for your homestead garden. Um, but yeah, we, we've had really good luck with Stella Blue, uh, the variety pictured with the star shape uh, cut in the middle. Uh, that has been bred uh, as a dry farm variety um, along the Eel River in Northern California. And then uh, Silver Bell and Tetsu Kabuto were standout varieties as well. Uh, uh, the dry farming collaborative hadn't been growing that, but Alex Stone and Jenny Wetzel, uh, their squash research um, show that these were standout varieties. So yeah, those three, uh, those three varieties, we uh, sent out seed and we had uh, participants, about 12 participants, who are also evaluating these varieties. And yeah, we'll have some results here pretty soon for the C Maxima trial. Uh, so here we are with the uh, potatoes. We've um, uh, grown potatoes and variety trials with the Dry Farming Collaborative for two years now. And um, just highlighting uh, some varieties that did well last year and then some of our observations this year. Uh, so in 2019, um, Purple Peruvian, German Butterball, Lily Cicleman, and Red Pontiac were all varieties um, that uh, did well and that we decided to uh, try to include this year in our potato variety trials. And we discovered that uh, some of the varieties we wanted to grow again were commercially unavailable, um, such as purple Peruvian and lily. We were able to get some seed uh, from uh, purple Peruvian from a grower in Eugene that shared some with us. And uh, so we included that on an isolated site. And lily, we had some saved back from last year's harvest from our storage trial to include. Um, but uh, so the varieties in 2020 that we selected were uh, based on availability and also uh, Chris Homanix, the plant breeder that's been working with us, uh, that works with potatoes, helped us select these varieties to include in our trial. And I'll just say overall, like there's been a lot of pest pressure this year in potatoes. Um, for example, in our harvest box, I would have loved to include uh, a lot of other varieties, but there was uh, a lot of wireworm damage. And um, for example, French fingerling is one I would have loved to also include in the har harvest box. But after we looked through those boxes, we were just like, wow, there's a lot of wireworm damage. So we opted not to include that one. So uh, in a situation where there wasn't a lot of wireworm or rodent pressure, there was a lot of vole uh, and uh, we didn't see them in action. So we don't know who the real culprits were, but there were a lot of potatoes with um, rodent damage um, at the sites that we managed. Um, but nevertheless, the, some of the standout varieties this year were Caribe. Uh, so that one, uh, actually, so in the picture, the top row were some of the earlier uh, varieties that we harvested. And on the bottom are, are some of the later varieties. But uh, Caribe on the top row, that second one, uh, has the purple flesh and the white 
um, uh, white uh, flesh, I'm sorry, the purple skin and the white flesh. And that, um, those were very uh, large uh, tubers, uh, pretty much our first to harvest along with the Corolla. And um, Cassandra said they're like biting into a snowflake. So good baking potato, apparently. And uh, Belmonda on the bottom row, um, second to last on the bottom row, that yellow potato was another one. When we harvested it, uh, it was yielding um, uh, higher than the other ones and just seemed to have less pest pressure. Um, so I just highlighted those two. Um, I can't say we haven't finished um, analyzing our data. We're still getting some in from our farmer participants, but uh, we just had a lot of pest pressure on the other one. So I'll be curious to see how some of the other potatoes, uh, how these potatoes performed on other sites. But I will say um, some issues uh, that we definitely noticed were with Papacacho uh, and Pinto Gold. Um, there was a lot of like kind of um, soft, wrinkly, uh, shriveled tubers for whatever reason. Uh, and red Pontiac, I think the seed we had we got actually had scab. So um, we saw a lot of um, unmarketable tubers from the red Pontiac this year, which may have been uh, due to a, a, seed, a disease that came in on the seed. So uh, that's it for potatoes for now. Okay, um, me again, <laughs> uh, and feel free anybody that has anything else to say about melons. I know Maricos and Lucas, you both harvested melons and grew some other varieties this year, but I just highlighted this from, highlighted some of these varieties based on our previous year trials. Uh, so in the watermelon category, uh, Christmas watermelon, which is um, the one there kind of in the center with the hand, uh, I think that's probably Bill Reynolds hand on that melon because that came from Seed Revolution now. And that um, variety has done well for us. Uh, each year we've grown it. I think we've grown it every year since 2015. Uh, we didn't do an extensive melon trial this year um, with the Dry Farming Collaborative. We just kind of, because we love melons, we included a couple of rows and um, worker satisfaction. It's nice to cut open a melon for the, the, the folks working in the field at lunchtime. But uh, Christmas watermelon is, is one of the more forgiving melons. Um, it'll hold in the field. Uh, you know, it's uh, some of the other melon varieties we've grown. It's like if you harvest a few days late, the texture is not great. So um, Christmas is just reliable and holds, holds well in the field. It's nice and crisp, good flavor. Um, Blacktail Mountain is that one on the um, top left, uh, the dark rind. And that is really nice because it's like the first melon, the first watermelon of the year to be harvested. And uh, it was ranked really high in our melon tasting last year at the Vegetable Research Farm. Um, cream of Saskatchewan, I listed uh, as, just because it's one of my personal favorites. Um, it, it is not, doesn't hold as well, in, as well in the field as Christmas watermelon, for example. It has the if you look at that top right picture, it's the light or the pale yellow flesh on the very right is the cream of Saskatchewan. And um, it just has a really beautiful kind of floral flavor. And um, a lot of people really love that one. Our crew definitely did when we grew that last year. And then in the musk melon category, um, Eel River is a dry farm variety. We also got along with that Christmas watermelon seed from Seed Revolution now. So it comes from a dry farm system. And I, I think um, uh, a lot of folks would agree with me that this is just a really great tasting melon and it has a really beautiful texture when dry farmed. And then uh, another one to mention here is, um, it's misspelled there, not the minute soda, but the Minnesota midget. And uh, that's a small cantaloupe pictured on the bottom right. And um, one of our uh, dry farming collaborative members in Astoria, so up on the North Coast, really likes this variety because it's a small, early maturing variety. When we grew it here in the valley last year, um, we thought it had an issue, but we weren't, uh, you're supposed to harvest it a little early and then it ripens on the counter. And we were waiting too long to harvest it. So it was a harvester error, uh, not Minnesota midget's fault. And um, I think I'd like to try that variety again and just um, try harvesting a little earlier. So 
Um, Maricos, Lucas, do you have anything to add about melons and um, from your trials this year? Any notable varieties? Uh, yeah, I'll just add that uh, this year at one of our research sites, we just focused on uh, musk melon and uh, we've always liked Eel River. And this year we didn't try Minnesota Midget, but we got a couple Charente varieties, which are uh, French musk melon uh, varieties. And they're provided to us from Earthworks Organics. And um, yeah, they're not, as far as I can tell, they're not commercially available, but um, there, there is an interesting storage type called Anna Charente. Anna's like, yeah, Anna's. And then uh, D'Artagnan was, was another variety that um, wasn't really for, as forgiving as the Anna's in terms of uh, when you harvest it, sometimes it was not ripe enough or it was, or it was too ripe. There's a small harvest window, but uh, yeah, that's the Charité varieties in general uh, seem to have done pretty well dry farmed. So yeah, we're going to have a, a little uh, report on that, on how they yielded compared to the Eel River this year. I'll just add that the Eel River texture is like one of the best food experiences that, that I've experienced and it's pretty, uh, pretty luscious. And one more note on that Eel River is just that um, I dehydrated some this year and they're really good dehydrated. I know that other folks have done that, but this is my first year doing it. And um, anyway, I'd highly recommend trying it if you've got extra Eel Rivers around. Hi there. So I'm gonna showcase uh, some of the beans that we're, we've grown and um, kind of talk about the difference between the common and the temporary. Uh, so they're both from like Central, um, the Central America, but the tepary beans were largely cultivated in the Southwest so, uh, because they were so resilient in drought conditions that received 16 inches of rain or less. So it was uh, extremely important for uh, the native people there. Um, and the difference between the two uh, when cooking is the uh, tepary's seem to hold their form a little bit better. They're a little bit more firm and they also have a uh, more of a nutty flavor, whereas common beans are have a larger yield, but are also a little more dependent on water. Um, for the whipples, uh, they are typically used in like bean, uh, I'm sorry, in chilies and soups, um, along with a, like the rock well and beefy resilient grex, which are varieties that the Dry Farming Collaborative has been working with over the last few years and kind of focusing on and saving seed from. Uh, the beefy resilient grex is a variety that is a cross between a tepary and a common bean. So there's a lot more varietal difference in those. So if you save seed, you can select your plants based on characteristics and you'll be able to kind of, based on the site you're growing on, um, you'll be able to select for what does well so that way you can hopefully carry those traits forward versus a lot of the other ones are kind of more adopt, adapted for uh, different characteristics. The rock wells do really well germinating in cooler soils, for example. Um, so that's what I have. If there's anything else Amy or Lucas would like to share. Yeah, I'll just say it's our, our first year trialing the, the last, well, first year trialing all of these tepary beans. We've had good success with Sacaton Brown on the bottom left of this panel. Um, and that continued to look good this year. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll have a lot more recommendations shortly when we look at our yields and uh, get to, a chance to taste these varieties. Um, in addition, yeah, Ross, Rosa de Luca, Marfax, Zolfino, and the Hungarian rice bean. This is our first year growing all of those. Uh, they were also, those are all available at uh, Uprising Seeds. They were um, recommended to us by uh, Lane Salmon and the Culinary Breeding Network. And so it was a little bit of a collaboration with them. And yeah, so far they did well, dry farmed. Um, 
Uh, some of them, uh, Zolfino and Hungarian rice bean, sort of were on the later side. Other than that, um, they finished up, the beans finished up well in our climate. So uh, before we go into our interactive session, we have a, a good question here from, from Amy, I have a question for you. Sure. So dry farm tomatoes are supposedly tastier and winter squash that are dry farm supposedly last longer. But I was wondering, are dry farm jack-o'-lanterns any spookier? I suspect so. <laughs> So look for that research in, in 2021 about the spookiness of uh, dry farm jack-o'-lanterns. So now we'd like to uh, get into some breakout rooms and, and have uh, discussions here. Yeah, so it'll be pretty brief. I'm gonna send you into breakout rooms of about four people. Um, and here are the questions, but I'm gonna go ahead and try to send them to you all in your breakout room so you have them available. One of us will be in each room so we can answer any questions that you may have. Um, so it'll be about 10 minutes and then we'll reconvene for any final questions um, and a brief discussion. Okay. All right, um, everybody's filtering back in from the breakout rooms. Sorry it was such a short amount of time. Hopefully you had some meaningful discussion um, and we'll get an opportunity to just quickly debrief um, and, and bring up any final questions that you may have or comments. Um, and that'll be a wrap on uh, the 2020 field tours. Yay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so Amber has a question about, um, she would like to know where is Dirty Girl from? I could answer that question. Um, so we originally got that seed. Um, so I called um, Dirty Girl Produce. Uh, there's a guy that last, his last name, I think it's Schirmer, Joe Schirmer, I think is the, uh, maybe the manager at that. And there was an article I found on the Dirty Girl Tomato, and it's a dehybridized, dry farmed early girl. So early girl is a hybrid. So if you plant out the seeds from early girl, you don't necessarily get uh, some of the same tomatoes. And Dirty Girl has been dehybridized. So we got it as an F5 generation, but I couldn't, um, I wasn't able, uh, Joe did not have extra seed for to sell us the year I inquired, but the next year, I think it was 2017, um, I, uh, our student research assistant found them at Tradewinds, uh, for, uh, it was a, it's a seed company, and they had seed available. So we planted it out that year, saved seed, and have been planting it since. So I guess that's a, that's a brief backstory on the Dirty Girl. Um, another tomato question, just a verbal, since that was a tomato question too, is, um, paste tomato varieties that was brought up in our breakout room like were there any paste tomato varieties that did well or that didn't get blossom and rot in the variety trial we we did have a few um one of them is a local variety that uh sunbow farm in corvallis has been um farming and keeping seed uh matt you you know more of the story behind the teardrop paste tomato um I believe it started as a Heinz tomato. Yeah. Yeah, it was like the Heinz paste tomato. Let me look up Harry's email here really quick. And then while he's doing that, uh, a couple of others that we found were the Baylor paste tomato did pretty well, um, just observationally and preliminarily. And then um, Heidi was a really beautiful paste tomato that, um, we abandoned kind of early on, but when we went back to look at them, um, they're, they're, they were like perfect. And, and really quick, like a little aside on what we mean by a tomato doing well. Um, one of the uh, things that can happen in dry farm systems uh, is uh, blossom end rot, which basically um, due to drought stress, the um, tomatoes become unmarketable. 
Um, it has to do with the physiology of the plant, but basically the uh, blossom end, it turns black and it, and it shrivels and it rots. And um, so when we, we were looking for tomato variety, because this is such a big problem in dry farming, we were looking for tomato varieties that could, um, you know, be grown without this problem. Like all the tomatoes, the, the foliage looked great. You know, the plants looked really good, but you know, some of the varieties where every single fruit would have blossom and rot. And so we're looking at these varieties that didn't um, have any blossom and rot. Um, and teardrop was one of those where it was little to no blossom and rot. Um, apparently, uh, Harry McCormick of, yeah, um, Sumbo Farms uh, bred it. Um, it's a uh, Heinz paste tomato that was crossed with uh, Oregon Spring, which is uh, an Oregon State University variety. Um, so I don't know if that is commercially available. Um, if you would like, you can ask Sumbo and maybe they will give it to you. Um, so. Yeah, thanks for making that distinction, Matt, the blossom and drop. That is what we were evaluating for. Um, and then Eliza had a question about um, pruning and staking, if staking helped at all. I don't know if you've had a chance to analyze that data or not, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so trellising with tomatoes is something that we did this year, and the data started out really promising. Um, so we had two different sites where we, you know, were comparing sprawled tomatoes with the pruned and the staked tomatoes. And early on, the tomatoes that were pruned and staked, the fruit were larger, um, and then they, uh, they had less blossom and rot. So that was pretty exciting. Um, but then later in the growing season, um, there was like kind of a switch. Um, so by the end of the whole experiment, there wasn't much of a difference between the two. Um, we believe that blossom end rot is really caused by, you know, this inter interaction between early luxuriant growth followed by um, stress. And so maybe by pruning early in the growing season that reduced that growth, but then, you know, by the end of the growing season, the plants had caught up. And so maybe by continuing to prune throughout the growing season, you can continue to maintain that effect. We don't know, um, but, but it is interesting. And it definitely was surprising to see early in the season how well the um, tomatoes that were trellised and, and pruned did. Looks like there's a question here from Bonnie. Um, uh, have you tried dry farming Sheboygan? I've never heard of that one. Anybody, if anybody else uh, on this, um, you know, in this meeting uh, has any feedback, feel free to, you know, unmute or share. I, I, but I don't personally. Anyone else? Well, you know, we are we are trialing about 200 tomatoes a year right now uh, with um, our uh, project. So I will add that to the list because we are always looking for new tomatoes to trial. And um, yeah, if you let me know where we can get the seeds, I will see about getting that in next year. We had a question about uh, pest control by Katie. Um, the dry farming group hasn't done much testing of pest control. You know, blossom end rot is actually not a fungal pathogen. Um, I, I know just from observation that uh, we, we see more, more insects like cucumber beetles, more insect pests hanging out in the cooler, wetter irrigated sections than in the dry farm. In terms of pest susceptibility, it's hard for me to say which like if dry farming makes things more or less susceptible to pests, but uh, I don't know if anyone has anything to add. It's just a question we haven't addressed very much in the dry farming collaborative at this point. That'd be a great uh, grad student project. There was a particular, um, you know, pest. Um, that'd be an interesting thing to dive into a little bit. But yeah, uh, as Lucas said, we haven't really focused any research on pest control or IPM and dry farm systems. Uh, we've kind of focused on variety trials so far and now soil management um, practices and done some selection, seed saving and some plant breeding, but 
that would be a great area to do some more work on.